Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. I'm your host, Nick Belsky, joined as always by Nick Horwat, and the Penguins suffered a, a tough loss last night to the Toronto Maple Leafs. There's obviously a couple of coaching decisions that have been widely maligned online, and I think we need to dive into those as this episode gets underway but also we want to talk about some positives and Eric Carlson has been an unmitigated positive for the Penguins over the last handful of games and as we've been saying for most of the season he's been a positive most of the season but taking his game to another level that much we will discuss a little bit later and then our weekly pens poll talking a little bit about the other teams currently in the race for wild card two and metropolitan three who poses the biggest threat to the Pittsburgh Penguins we'll discuss that in a little bit but Horwat. Penguins fall three to two to the Toronto Maple Leafs on the road. What did you make of this performance as a whole? First period, I thought looked good. Some mm-hmm. people saying the best they've looked all season long. I don't know about that, but they certainly look good. And then second and third, Toronto looked to be the better team and certainly the team that is already clinched in the playoffs and not fighting for the playoffs at this stage of the game. Yeah, I certainly don't know about best first period they've had this season. Uh, Certainly one of the better ones. Uh, Being able to shut a team like that down, uh, keep them off the score sheet, let alone keep them to so few shots in the first period. Uh, It was just a solid effort in the first period. Scoring obviously helps with that. And um, it seemed like the Penguins knew what they were doing. And I don't want to say the wheels kind of fell off in the second and third, but uh, you could tell the legs weren't there. These guys are probably a little gas. It's been a long couple of games. I mean, we talked about them entering a gauntlet for their final nine games and they're five games into it and have had, you know, a, they had a tough game against Toronto. It, it was a tough battle against Tampa Bay. Uh, playing back-to-backs in New York and New Jersey to kick off that gauntlet didn't really help. So um, you could say that for the most part, at least, uh, maybe they're just getting a little gas and they need they have a well-deserved day off today. Uh, they have a well-deserved day off before Toronto too, but travel, you know, issues at the border, you know, things happen, <laughs> but yeah, it's, you know, I'm not totally upset with the, with the overall, with the overall performance, really. You, the Penguins managed to get a point out of it, a very big positive point. Um, It'll be interesting to see how they react from there. And overall, I'd say it was a fine game. Uh, again, that's a, Toronto's a team that can, as the Penguins saw already this season, can pop seven on you. The fact that the Penguins mm-hmm. held them to three is a good start, and the fact that they've managed to get, get that overtime point out of them, uh, it, just in my eyes, is another positive. They kept themselves in the race and are still right there. Yeah, you mentioned the overtime point. That's now points in nine straight games for the Penguins, a 6-0-3 record in their last nine. Uh, hard to refute, especially when you get that late goal by Drew O'Connor to push it into overtime to show a little bit more of that resiliency that they've kind of been showing more so over the last two weeks than they did the previous, you know, five months to be completely honest with you. But let's get into Mike Sullivan because he's catching a lot of heat online for a bevy of decisions that he made. And it started earlier in the day before the game even started when it was announced that Alex Nedeljkovic would be starting his ninth straight game. It could be looked at as simply riding the hot hand. And I think that's exactly what it was. But were you surprised that this wasn't the game that they tried to get Tristan Jari a little bit of action here since he hasn't started or played really in over two and a half weeks? Yeah, I thought this would be the one. I thought this would be the one, not necessarily because um, it's you know, your your game off or because of its, uh, you know, uh, the odds were against the Penguins heading in, I think, in the first place. It would have been a good test for Jari to show that Maybe he could still make this an interesting battle for for the for the starting role down the line if he was able to step up and maybe really show something against Toronto and not only Jari show something against Toronto but get Nadelkovich that rest that I mean, you mentioned it nine straight. I mean, even whenever you're not riding the hot hand and you're just playing your normal system, that's still a, a rare number to hit these days. I mean. Especially in especially this season for the Penguins, nine straight is uh, uncommon. So I was a little surprised, although also not totally shocked. You know what I mean? It, it was a little bit of both. It was, yeah, I could see it happening, but also would have figured this would have been Jari's game. Mm-hmm. I mean, now you're going into a day off plus a practice day, and then Detroit. I have figured the bigger 
in terms of standings points, more important games for your playoff hunt are the ones Nadelkovich would have gotten. Mm-hmm. That would have that would be Detroit and then the Islanders down at the end of the season. That's just what I figured would happen. Maybe Jari would get Toronto and would maybe get Boston, but uh, we'll see what happens going forward. Now it's is it possible Jari just doesn't see the ice for the rest of the year? It that that's extremely possible. I don't think that should be the case. That's just my opinion, but it seems pretty possible. Yeah, and that's where I was going to go next with this. And honestly, I think that's 100% correct. I don't think Tristan Jari touches the ice again, or at least shouldn't touch the ice again the remainder of the season because I thought last night was the night. That's the night you get Tristan Jari some action. That's the night you get Alex Nadelkovich a little bit of a break because like you mentioned, you're going in against a team that is very, very talented on the road that is right now still vying for home ice advantage. So they still have something to play for. And if Jari would have went in and struggled and not played well and you would have lost that game, you have four games remaining and you were sitting in a half-decent position because going into yesterday, they held the playoff fate in their own hands. So even you lose that game and we saw them lose it in overtime, you still have the game against the Red Wings, the game against the Islanders that are massive and you can make up those four-point swings in one game in 60 minutes, but also you have games against the Bruins and the Predators. They're not off days by any stance. And throwing Jari in for the first time in three weeks in one of those games when there's not much real, like runway to go after that, that's when I get you know a little concerned if you end up putting him in. But I, I honestly think that now that we didn't see him against Toronto and, and Ned looked good once again, I don't think we're going to see Tristan Jari again this season. It's not as much a knock on Jari. It's just the position that they've put themselves in right now is they're going to ride the hot hand. There's four games left in the season, you're going to empty the tank to get to the playoffs and we'll see what happens from there. Yeah. It's, it does. It, you don't want to say you're playing with house money at this point, but you're kind of close to it considering everyone had the penguins counted out. And then what did you do? You rifled off points at nine straight. Uh, no one expected this to happen. And why not continue going for it? Why not continuing emptying the tank? Just, you know, emptying the clip against every team you can. And that includes, keeping in the better goalie at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's interesting that this is happening about the same time that uh, Pierre Lebrun put out that article with Martin Brodeur where he said uh, goalies are babied these days, you know, and are not, you know, playing the same sort of game. I mean, Martin Brodeur played damn near 80 games every season. Yeah. Um, So it's interesting seeing that not long after that comes out, Nadelka was just going on a nine game streak and we're sitting here thinking, is this too many games in a row for him? Yeah. We have to remember that these, you know, maybe there is a little truth to what Broder said in it's a different position these days. And that and like Kyle Dubas and like Mike Sullivan said, before the season started, you're going to need two, maybe three goalies, maybe even four in certain teams cases to get through your whole season. Mm-hmm. Um, and here we are in the final stretch of the year, and suddenly what Brodeur is saying is, uh, yeah, if Nadelkovic goes on this heater and rifles off the 9, 10, 11 straight, however many it needs to be to put the Penguins in the postseason, don't be shocked by it because these guys are still top-tier athletes and can handle this. So I'm not going to be shocked by any goalie decision that the Penguins make from here on in. They have faith in both guys. We just haven't seen one of them in a while. Uh, and... If they do make the postseason, obviously it'll be on the back of the dog pitch, and that's the guy you roll with. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see. Also, Elliot Friedman had an interesting note on Jari and 32 Thoughts, so go check that out if you care. <laughs> There's yeah. some fun happening this offseason again. Yeah, and it wasn't just the goaltending decision that people had some issue with. It was in the game, late in the game, whenever Mike Sullivan decided to bench the young guys in the third period with the Penguins trailing by one goal. Jeff Carter moves up to the third line alongside Lars Eller and Riley Smith. Emil Bemstrom, Valtteri Pustin, and and Yessa Pugliarvi effectively benched in that third period. They got a couple of shifts here and there, but they did not get on the ice very much, and the top two lines were double shifted to hell and back. And as a result, Eller, O'Connor, and Carlson start in the overtime frame. They don't get off the ice. Penguins lose 3-2, to and... While, yes, it's not a dagger, it's not the end of the world, it's not eliminating them from playoff contention, it stings to not get that extra point 
especially considering it was right there for the taking. And a lot of people are upset that when it's right there for the taking, you don't throw out your best players. Now, Mike Sullivan did say after the game that Sidney Crosby was dealing with a skate issue, which is why he wasn't out there to start overtime. Evgeny Malkin stayed on the bench. Brian Russ did not get an opportunity there. Drew O'Connor does get an opportunity, but with a guy like Lars Eller, I found it interesting that, yeah, if Crosby was still struggling to get his skate issue fixed because it was something throughout the remainder of the game, that you wouldn't throw Evgeny Malkin out there. And I know you have you know, a couple of thoughts on this, so I'll toss it over to you to talk about this. Mm -hmm. But I was, I think it was, a, it was a result of the fact that you double shifted these guys late and you went with Lars Eller because he was probably the most fresh guy at this stage of the game. And it, I didn't like that. I think it was mismanagement, but that's what I, I feel like happened on Monday night. So I asked Sullivan about this in February, whenever they lost to the Islanders in overtime. And again, it was a similar situation. They started with Lars Eller. I don't think he got off the ice. I didn't look back at the actual timing of that game. Um, but Lars Eller has been starting a lot of the overtimes for the Penguins this season. It's not a new thing. Um, and one of the reasons that Sullivan gave me in February was sometimes the Crosby line or those players are out there for an extended period leading into the overtime. So they need that little bit of extra rest. Okay, so I'm not one to question Mike Sullivan, by the way, but skate issue, okay, fine. Uh, maybe that maybe that was a thing. I don't know. I wasn't there to see if uh, the training staff was work or the equipment staff was working on Crosby skate, but we saw him have that issue earlier in the game. Sure. Um, but when it comes to okay, so you're not starting Crosby. Also, Crosby's numbers are awful, awful in an overtime play. And I get that. Well, that doesn't matter. The seasons and I'm with the, it, that doesn't matter. The seasons on the, are pretty, is pretty much on the line. He's been a different animal these days. Um, who's to say this isn't the time where it turns into one and five rather than oh and mm -hmm. six. That's that point. Uh, as for the Malkin thing, Malkin is just not good in three on three. It's, I get that people again say that it's, he's also a different animal at this point. He's also going to try and, do more with the season on the line. The issue is, is that Malkin's track record whenever games are on the line isn't great. I said it, you know, about last season and that Hurricanes overtime, that that was essentially the beginning of the end of that season when he chased uh, whoever it was, Jacob Slavin, behind the net, and they and the Hurricanes immediately went down and scored. I said that felt like the beginning of the end of that season. I mean, you're down to Lars Eller. I think Drew O'Connor's an interesting choice. I guess he's been having a really good season offensively. Uh, but Lars Eller is nothing new. This is a guy that Sullivan has repeatedly turned to in this situation. Um, it's something that he did last year too, except I think it was with Jeff Carter winning faceoffs and then immediately skating off. Mm -hmm. So this galaxy braining the overtime thing is nothing new for Sullivan. I think a big issue is too, is that they don't practice it. I, I don't think I've seen them do it this year. And at this point it's too late to start. <laughs> Um, well, and, and it doesn't matter because there's four games left in the season. I mean, exactly. if, I, if it comes down to an overtime, you're going to you're going to shoot yourself in the foot there. But at the same time, what is one practice going to do? Like you said, they're yeah. off today. They have one practice tomorrow, and I believe it's every other day the yeah. remainder of the season. So yeah. it's like, how much are you really going to, to work on something you haven't worked on in five months and really improve it? Yeah, it's it's a tough decision to make. And to cap this all off, though. Lars Eller buries that goal in the first few seconds. Not, none of us are having this this conversation. If, yes. And that's always it's always what it's been. It's always been about the ifs. But we see what happened. I'd say that when it comes down to it, this was just Mike Sullivan sticking to his guns because he's been doing it all season. Like I said, I asked him this mm -hmm. a month and a half ago, and yeah. clearly nothing's changed. Yeah, the at the end of the day, like you mentioned it there, it's Galaxy branding the situation. You have five games remaining or four games and whatever's left of that game at that point remaining. Put out your best players. Bet on your best players. They've been do they did it the entire third period. Yeah. The entire third period is out there. And I understand Evgeny Malkin, not great at three on three overtime. Sidney Crosby this season, not great at three on three overtime. In particular, when the puck is not in the Penguins possession, Crosby has been pretty rough in three on three. You know who else has been defensively at three on three? Eric Carlson. And he was out there the entire time as well. So I think it was just galaxy braining it. But I also think, you know, it plays a part. What he told you in February, what we saw last night, you had to double shift those guys because mm -hmm. you didn't trust the bottom six. And, and 
go on to moneypuck.com and look at the expected goals, the, the chart. It is top six and best defenseman at the top and bottom six at the bottom and a huge chasm in between. So I understand it. The bottom six wasn't performing. What I don't understand is why is Jeff Carter, who had zero shots on goal when on the ice, not him, the Penguins had zero so shots on goal when he's on the ice. Why does he get the preference to go up with Lars Zeller and, and Riley Smith? That's the thing that I think a lot of people are going to look at and say, that's Mike Sullivan playing the favorites. That's Mike Sullivan not trusting in the young guys. And that is a huge blind spot for this head coach and has been for the last couple of seasons. If not, you know, some people point to his entire coaching career with the Penguins. I think that there's obviously some holes in that theory, but especially maybe since 2022, he has been all in for, we're going to go with the veterans, even if the veterans aren't the best option when it comes to the actual play. It's their intelligence, it's their mind that he's going to put faith in. And I, I personally, I don't agree with it, but again, he's the one coaching the team. He makes the decisions and that's the end all be all. But I just think when I saw that and I saw Jeff Carter taking shifts instead of Valtteri Pustin and not putting up a guy like Yesapul Yarvi, who I thought had a pretty good first period, and not even giving him a shot either. Yeah. I think that's when I get a little agitated watching and saying, you know, why are we banging our head against the door with Jeff Carter, who's also having a very bad game, who was also the reason the Toronto Maple Leafs scored the first goal because he couldn't tie his guy up in the crease. So that's what that's what bothers me is watching that and saying where did that come from? I understand, you know, you need to double shift the, the top guys, but I don't understand the way you're deploying the bottom six and the chance you're giving them to try to kick it into high gear, especially once the game was tied. So, you know, there, there's, we could debate these questions until the cows come home because, you know, at the end of the day, this is all stuff that is opinion based. And this is all stuff that is based on what we didn't see. Like we saw what we saw and we can infer opinions on what would have happened if he went, a different direction, but at the end of the day, that game's over, and as the Penguins are going to do, uh, hopefully, move on to the remaining four and move on to looking towards what they need to do now to get into the playoffs now that this one is in the books as an OTL. But we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, let's talk about one of the players that was out there for three-on-three -three overtime because it wasn't his bright, shining moment on Monday night, but he has had a few shining performances over the last week, and that is Eric Carlson. We'll discuss him after the break. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by inside the penguins.com. I bring up Eric Carlson for a simple fact, Horwat. We've talked about him all season long as maybe not what a lot of people were expecting, but still better than a lot of people are giving him credit for. And now I think he's starting to get credit from every corner of the fan base simply because he's taken his game to an entirely different level. If you look at what he's done over the last five games for the Penguins, he has five points, so a point per game pace there. 56% of the shot attempts, the Penguins are outscoring opponents at five on five by a total of five to two, and he has the most expected goals created on the Pittsburgh Penguins team in general and has generated 40, or the Penguins, I should say, have generated 44 scoring chances over the last five games at five on five with Eric Carlson on the ice. What do you make? of EK65 and his recent performance. Uh it took I don't I don't want to say it took him long enough for it to finally break through and you know everyone can see it and it's obvious that he's you know in a really good spot now. Um but because this is something we we've been banging his drum all season. Uh it's really just hitting a new stride. It is hitting that new level of visibility of his footwork has looked pretty incredible. He's there are multiple times a game where it looks like oh, he's backed himself into a corner and this is the Eric Carlson everyone is getting on. And then next thing you know, there's two guys behind him and he's got open ice with the puck still. It's he's flipped a switch in this in this uh in this nine game stretch here, much like the other three members of the core have. It is mm -hmm. about that time for Crosby Malk and Latang and now Eric Carlson. They've stepped up they found their game they've really turned things around especially for guys like Crosby and Malkin who looked pretty poor in all honesty if just a couple of weeks ago um and then starting with that 
Colorado game, maybe a couple of games before it, but they all four of them have found a new level. And for Eric Carlson, it's a bit more obvious because of how uh, because of how much because of how under a microscope he is and for how much criticism he was catching all season long. Um, this is a good spot for him to be in because he is now still under that microscope, but also people are starting to see what he can do because it's really starting to work out. He's starting to shoot the puck. I can't say a lot more considering he led the team in shot attempts. Yeah. Uh, but he's starting to make wiser shooting decisions. Mm -hmm. They're starting to get through a little more. Um, he's getting good tips. He's getting good shots on goal. He's creating a lot more offense, which is what he was brought here to do. The numbers aren't probably still aren't where everyone wanted them to be, but I mean, he's leading the defense and scoring. So that's mm -hmm. square one. Yeah. Over 50 points for the eighth time in his career. I think the big thing to me and the big reason why I feel like a lot of people are starting to jump on the, Oh, he's actually playing really well right now. Train is his compete level feels like it's a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. Carlson is that level of athlete where a lot of professional athletes do things and make it look easy. Everything Carlson does well, he makes look easy. Skating, passing, vision. He makes it all look like he's not trying because it's that easy for him. And he's not exerting extra energy in order to make the play because he doesn't have to. But I think what you've seen over the last handful of weeks is that compete level starting to be elevated. That give me the puck and let me take this home type of attitude where before... He's working with superstars. He's working with guys that he trusts to finish the plays that he sets up. Now, does that happen all the time? No, the Penguins are notoriously one of the worst finishing teams in the National Hockey League. So when they don't finish those plays, it becomes a moot point if you're not paying close attention. But what you've seen in the last couple of weeks is in both zones, he's been more physical. He's been on the puck in the defensive zone, especially even if he makes a mistake, which those are still going to happen. Mm -hmm. He's not going to turn into, you know, the perfect Nick Lidstrom. He's not going to do that. But when he makes those mistakes, what you're seeing is the compete level to get back, to make the play, to be physical, to try to knock guys off the puck, to try to use that, that good stick that everybody mentioned whenever you did a story before the yeah. season, what makes his defense a little bit better? Everybody said, oh, he has a good stick. Well, he's showing that more and more as this season is starting to become more and more important. These games are starting to become more and more important. And that compete level, that energy is starting to get elevated from Carlson. You saw it on Monday night against Toronto. He goes mm -hmm. end to end. How many times have we seen him do it? He made that look easy. Now, it didn't result in a shot attempt because the shot attempt wasn't there. But what he ended up doing was just shuffling it towards the net and hoping that somebody's there. Well, the only other issue is he's faster than everybody on the ice. So nobody else was even in the offensive zone yeah. by the time he got there. But you know, at the end of the day, what you're seeing is the compete level from Eric Carlson is elevating. And Mike Sullivan has said, on numerous occasions this year, when talking about Eric Carlson and answering the question from the media, what's wrong with Eric? Do you think there's another level to him? He says, yes, there is an entirely another level to Eric's game that we are trying to unlock with the Pittsburgh Penguins. I think you're starting to see that game get unlocked here in the home stretch when it matters most. And that's a huge thing for the Penguins. I love this, the, this saying that, we're, that we've been using a lot of when it matters most. I, I mean, it's mattered most for like three weeks now. Exactly. It's like, yeah, you're right. Technically, yes, still correct. These last nine games are going to matter the most, but also, boy, this would have been nice weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but still, it's Eric Carlson is doing Eric Carlson things. I think that's a big part of it. And when it comes to that that defense, I, he knocked the puck off of Austin Matthews a couple of times yesterday, and I think that was massive. I mean, you're especially in that first period, if you were able to – make sure that the Maple Leafs offense war, you know, just weren't around the puck as much as possible, you were going to be in for something decent. And they did that pretty much through the entire first period. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I keep saying this uh, to people that we've just stopped discussing the power play. And I think last night was another great example as to why it does not matter anymore. Yeah, I thought the power play looked good. They just didn't score, and it can look good all at once. It can look, score. It, it, yeah, it's got to look great. I'll tell you what, it's it, that's just the thing that's become that the power play has just become a non-factor. It doesn't even matter to the team anymore. Um, but Eric Carlson has been stepping up in the right ways, and honestly, even whenever they do score on the power play and they gain the momentum, 
a lot of the times, at least more recently, it's been because of Eric Carlson. Yeah. So there are net positives to be taken from Carlson. And uh, man, those trade rumors were hilarious <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, but who knows? I mean, it's he'll be around next season. He'll probably be around the season after that because uh, I'll tell you what, if they, the Penguins don't make it this year to the postseason, ooh, ooh, next year they're going to be hungry. They're going to be hungrier than they were this year. And you think, and Kyle Dubas seems to have a plan. Mm. So we'll see where it goes. Yeah, let's not put the cart before the horse. The Penguins still yeah. have a, what, I don't know what the percentage is on Money Puck, but they have a good good percent chance. 38.9. Hey, 38. 38.4. Let me read my own handwriting properly. Hey, that's fine because two weeks ago it was 1%. It was. So they still got a three, 38% chance of making the playoffs. They are right now, I believe, what, one point out? of the Detroit Red Wings or tied with the tied Detroit with Red the Wings. Red Wings. The, but the Red Wings have a game in hand. We'll talk about all of this. How about yeah. this? Let's take a break. Let's mm-hmm. come back and let's go to our Penn's poll where we're talking about the Red Wings, the Islanders, the Penguins, the Capitals, the Flyers, the Eastern Conference battle for the final two playoff spots. The Pens are in the thick of it. Who's their biggest threat? That much we'll discuss after the break. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. And before we get into our weekly Pens poll, I forgot to ask you off the top of the show, Horwat, how was the eclipse yesterday? I didn't see it because I didn't get glasses and there's been two other ones in my lifetime. So I wasn't too concerned about running to wherever to get them. I don't even know where you get them. So I didn't see it. But, you know, I saw that you were outside looking at the sun. How was it? Uh, I don't I actually don't know where you get the glasses from either. These ones just came from Megan's mother. So. Uh, although Megan's mom lives in Erie where they had the path of totality. So I'm sure those things were just everywhere like hotcakes. Um, and it was, it's fine. It's in general, it is still a flaming ball of fire in the sky. But, um, when you look at, I I always say when it comes to these eclipses, which by the way, we're not supposed to get another one for ever. I think, um, there will be another one. There will be another one at some point. And if not, it's the sun cool yeah. but it's the sun it doesn't you know personally i didn't care yeah the cool part of it is, is like it's cool kind of seeing like an actual shape go over the sun through these little glasses um but the real fascinating part is looking around you and how the mm-hmm. the daylight is just gone in the middle of the day and it doesn't like it's one thing whenever like cloud cover is on you can tell it's a little darker it's a different vibe because you can tell the sun is still out when mm-hmm. this happens so it's interesting actually it got dark enough to the the lights in my apartment complex turned on the uh the like the the street lights yeah i've uh, turned on automatically so well it is interesting it was the you said third in our lifetime i remember the last one i don't remember third or second i i don't remember because i do remember one happened when i was on a golf course and uh, it was it was it was like you mentioned it was sunny out but it was it was different Yep. Like the, the, the lighting seemed a little different. And then I also remember being on the back porch at my aunt's with the glasses looking up. So if that's in the same day, it might be because it was a little while ago, but I remember both of those instances. So there was either two or one in my lifetime. I'm 27. I would hope to make it to 54. And at that point I would assume there's at least one more, but you know, either way, I'm I don't not... know when the next one is to be fair. So that's kind of why I just said ever. I thought I saw 21 44, but you know, there's different eclipses. That's why. I, ah, I, yes. Correct. There's different types of eclipses and all of them, you know, I'm not smart enough to know the difference, so I'm not going to care the next time the one comes. I'm going to be like, that's the same one as 2024 because I don't know any different and I don't care to look it up to be completely honest. But let's let's talk about stuff we do know about, which is the NHL, the Eastern Conference playoff picture, the Pittsburgh Penguins. Do we, we know about the Eastern Bowl? Conference playoff picture? Because they certainly don't. Uh, we know that. We know a few things. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen because yeah. insanity has ensued over the last two weeks. So why would it be any different the next eight days? Uh, our weekly pens poll, we asked which team poses the biggest threat to the Penguins in the playoff race. You guys answered 53% of you said the New York Islanders who are currently in the third place position in the Metropolitan Division. 36% said the Detroit Red Wings, who will be in Pittsburgh on Thursday to take on the Penguins. 6% said the Washington Capitals and 5% said 
say the losers of seven straight, the Philadelphia Flyers. So Horowat, let me ask you, which team, in your opinion, poses the biggest threat to the Penguins in this playoff race? I'm going to have to, it's a tough one. I didn't really even look into kind of how the Penguins have fared against these teams, you know, earlier in the year. I think the Islanders are probably a good choice as well uh, because I mean, they're the team they finished the season off against. And given the string of games the Penguins have left, you got Detroit next. That's going to be massive. No matter what happens with Detroit tonight, um, that's going to be a big game for uh, the Penguins. Then they have Boston, which I'm going into with the same mindset as Toronto of that's a tough team. If you can pull a point out of, way to go. Uh, Nashville, I, I mean, I get Nashville used, was one of the hottest teams in the league. I think they've kind of simmered down. So maybe that's a winnable game with high vibes as well in the last game of the season. I believe that's Eric Carlson's game 1000. Don't quote me on that. That's coming up, though. It's 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 um, it's there. Yeah, it's one of these games that I've said. And then last game of the season against the New York Islanders. Who knows exactly what position both these teams will be in by then. Um, but. I mean, the Penguins in the last couple of seasons in must-win games haven't been phenomenal. Mm-hmm. So, I you could I'm going to say the Islanders not most mostly not by the points and where things are in the standings, but because of that last game of the season, that must-win situation on the island, no less. Uh, mm-hmm. Not going to be easy for the Penguins. I would tend to agree that of all of these teams, the Islanders are probably the one that I see as the biggest threat simply because, I mean, you're one point at they're one point ahead mm-hmm. with a game in hand. You have that head to head matchup that it might come down to. And also they have the most trustworthy goaltending in general. I know Ilya Sorokin is not having the greatest of seasons. Semyon Varlamov has looked pretty good and it seems like he doesn't age. Speaking of, you know, players that don't age, yeah. Semyon Varlamov seems to be steady as she goes still at this advanced age. So I would say it's probably the Islanders, but looking at the remaining schedule for all five of these teams, the Penguins were the only one to play last night. The other four play tonight, including a big matchup between the Washington Capitals and the Detroit Red Wings. And then the next three games for the Penguins, all the other four teams play on the same day. That's the 11th, the 13th and the 15th. So it's going to be interesting scoreboard watching. Nonetheless, the one thing about the Islanders, I will say though, is they have one, I don't want to say easy game. They have one game against a team that's out of it, and that's the Canadians. But you look at what else they have. The Rangers, who are fighting for President's Trophy, first seed, they have them twice. Ooh. They have them tonight. They have them on the 13th. Then they have the Devils on the road. Mm-hmm. These are all teams that would love to, to ruin the Rangers' party in, or the Islanders' party in any way, shape, or form. And then they have that day off and take on the Penguins. I think it's going to be intriguing because you look at these other teams, a lot of them are playing head-to-head. Detroit plays Pittsburgh and Washington. Pittsburgh plays Detroit and the Islanders. The Islanders, the only game they have left against any of these teams is Pittsburgh. Washington has Detroit. They have Buffalo, who's still lurking and has been playing spoiler the last couple of weeks. And they have Philly. And Philly obviously has Washington in, in, in unison there. It's going to be a photo finish. And I think the thing is, with the photo finish, the good thing is for the Penguins is there's two spots available right now. So it doesn't have to be you have to take down all four of these teams. You have to take down three of them. But I would say the Red Wings got 36% and the Capitals got 6%. And a lot of this hinges upon tonight's performance. The Capitals, to me, are a bigger threat than the Detroit Red Wings. And I know a lot of people are going to say, yeah, but the Penguins just disposed of the Capitals a couple of days ago. Yes, but the Capitals are one point behind the Penguins with the game in hand. There's no more head-to-head results, so you can't say, all right, well, they, they got their number this at, at this point, so they can go in and take that four-point swing again. The power play has been clicking. Alex Ovechkin has been an absolute menace to society since March began, and they have that opportunity to really knock Detroit off a pedestal tonight, not to mention a schedule that Buffalo... Tampa, Boston, Philly, it's going to be tough, but I do see them as a bigger threat than Detroit at this moment because they also know how to win. They're a young team, but they know how to win. And I know that gets thrown around, but 
man, it feels like Washington. I don't think a lot of people are giving them credit 6% in this poll. I see them as a bigger threat right now than the Red Wings because the Red Wings have been struggling since March started in the, the Capitals. They haven't been world beaters like the Penguins have been over the last two weeks, but they have been a better team than the Detroit Red Wings have been. Capitals are 0-4 and 2 in their last six. I think that's a that I think that's a big reason why a lot of people are going for Yeah, uh, they've they've dropped off since being in a very solid position. But I think the way that you've seen them play as of late, I mean, is the same way you've seen Detroit play over the last month. So it, you're <laughs> not picking great teams here for a while. Yeah. None of them oh, are no. great teams. Not at all. I mean, yeah. Detroit only has two wins in their last handful with uh, what looks like two overtime losses thrown in there. So two something and two in their last whatever. Like that's not phenomenal either. But uh, it's it's a turtle race. That's the that's the big it's, issue it is. with this is that every team is so mid <laughs> that the Penguins having points in nine straight now it it's mind blowing. That that's what it took to, and they're still not in the playoffs in a playoff spot. That's kind of how far behind they were. Um, it's just every team is just deciding to all of a sudden fall off the face of the earth. No one wants those that third metropolitan spot or that uh, second wild card spot. It, it, the Flyers who are who looked to be on some miraculous run this year are we haven't even discussed them. They seem to be done and cooked. Seven straight losses. Yikes. That's what we expected from them to start the year. Yeah. Um, but it's it's just getting to that point where all these teams are so not willing to win that the Penguins just need to take full advantage. Yeah. I don't want to say these teams aren't willing to win, but they look unable. Superior. They're not consistent, none of yeah. them. The, the yeah. volatility with all five of these teams is ridiculous. So honestly, any of these answers might be right. Who's the biggest threat? Except for maybe the Philadelphia Flyers because they don't have a track record and they also sucked over the last couple of weeks, like seven straight losses. But we said, what, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, Penguins are going to basically have to win out just to get in the race. Well, they basically won out to this yeah. point and they're just in the race. They haven't solidified anything. In fact, they're not even sitting in a playoff spot. They spent, what, 24 hours inside a playoff spot and then they wow. got booted by the Detroit Red Wings. So it's going to be a photo finish, like we both said. And who's the biggest threat? I saw somebody on Twitter, I should look this up, because he said, where's the option to say the Penguins are their own biggest threat? Because that might honestly be, that's it might honestly too. be the best answer there. It is, and that's absolutely true too. Because, and that's when it would come down to one of those island, would it also being the Islanders in the last game of the season is, well, it's a must-win situation. We've seen the Penguins lose in very, very, very dramatic fashion multiple times this season, multiple times last season. Uh, if it's another dramatic loss, then it's absolutely they're, they're themselves once again. Yeah. The good thing is they're playing good teams. So there's no, you know, there's no trap game. There's no 30th ranked team in the NHL that you're supposed to beat anyway. It's all good teams. So you're going to have to perform either way. There's no trap games. And I, I think the idea of a trap game is a little bit ridiculous at this stage of the game with the team as, you know, experienced as the Penguins. But, you know, we saw it last season, so it's it's kind of hard to refute. Uh, shout out to Bob on Twitter. Uh, said, where's the option to vote for themselves as the biggest threat? I think that's uh, certainly a good idea, uh, especially after what we saw last night. I still don't agree with the coaching moves, but again, we had a discussion on that already, and we don't need to dive back into that. But that's going to do it for this episode of The Tip of the Iceberg. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.